Hello, Springs Church family. Pastor Zach here. Thank you for tuning in to this online message. I want to encourage you that if you have found this message particularly impactful, to please share it with others. It is wonderful that we as a church family can continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and be the light of the world, not only to our community, but to rural South Dakota and all over the world. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. I think of you and pray for you often. God bless. Well, church, you can go ahead and have a seat. Um, did anybody take driver's ed in high school? Was that a sort of thing for some of you? Right in high school, I took driver's ed, and uh, we uh, not only had to take driver's ed, but then you take driver's ed so then you can go and take the driving test and be ready for it and have the exam and hopefully pass. Uh, my driver's ed teacher bragged about how none of his students ever failed, that uh, he was such a good driver's ed teacher that when you go to take that exam, you will pass if you put into practice everything that had been taught, and, uh, and how no student had ever failed the exam except for one. And he said that this student, this teenager, went and took the driving exam, and as they were finished, did a perfect job on the driving that the examiner didn't have anything to mark that was incorrect. They stepped out of the vehicle, and the teen said, oh, I'm sure glad I don't have to drive like that all the time. <laughs> Which then, of course, how are you going to pass somebody and say you're ready to drive, right? <clears throat> you know, how, many, how many of us have we ever just, I'm just going to study to pass the test. You know, how many of us just, you know what, I'm, of course I'm going to do the right thing because I know I'm being watched. I mean, if, if that's the kind of people we are all the time, like who are we really? Who are we really if we only do the right thing when we know that we're being watched or we know we're going to be tested or we know that there will be consequences? You know, we've been working through 1 Peter chapter 1 um, with a series of sermons that center on the theme of living, the name of this sermon series, Living. And so we've been working through 1 Peter just chapter 1, and, uh, and today we're going to talk about the final part of 1 Peter 1, and uh, the sermon is hope and holiness. Hope and holiness. In this series, we've been asking the question, you know, are we really living? Are we living? Are we living into the freedom that we have been given? Are we living lives that have been raised to new life? How are we living? Are we living in a way that shows the hope that we have in Christ? Now, I was gone last week. I was on vacation with my family. We were out in the Black Hills. We had a good time. We got to see the Roundup. It was wonderful. Uh, but if you showed up to, in church last week to hear the final part of this sermon series, of course, I wasn't here. I was a guest speaker. Um, but if you remember from two weeks ago, when we were working through 1 Peter, we ended with uh, chapter 1, verse 12. And uh, so that was last week. Uh, sorry, excuse me, two weeks ago. And in those last few passages... Um, we read about the glorious salvation that we have in Christ and, and how that should bring us joy. Um, I made the mistake two weeks ago of giving the comparison of joy and happiness, and I said that I have joy in Christ and that that remains unaffected by the world, but happiness is situational, and I gave the analogy that if the Chiefs were to lose to the Colts, I would not be happy, and I shouldn't have done that because what happened? Well, the Chiefs lost, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I posted on Facebook, I'm not happy, and right away someone was like, oh, did the Chiefs lose? <laughs> I was like, yes, and thank you for listening to the sermon, all right? <laughs> um, but we talked about the salvation that we have in Christ and how that brings us this overwhelming joy that is not based on our situations. And then today, as we enter into verse 13, we see this one word, therefore, now, anytime you're reading the Bible, to tip on your own personal Bible study, if you ever read the Bible and you see the word, therefore, you have to ask the question, what is therefore, therefore? Right? <laughs> what is therefore? Why is it there? What is it there for? Well, so because we have this overwhelming joy, this never-ending joy that comes from the glorious salvation we've been given through Christ, because of that, in light of that, then this is how we should live. It says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace that is to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So not only the grace you've experienced now, 
But when Jesus comes back and he separates people left from right like sheep and goats, when we all stand before the judgment seat of God, we can set our hope not in the things that we have done, not in the things that I have accomplished, but instead our hope is set in the grace, in the grace that has been brought through God. The grace that will be poured out for anything that I've messed up, but the grace of God overshadows all of that, and we are forgiven. Now, because of that, as obedient children, we do not conform to the evil desires that we once had when we lived in ignorance, before we knew really right from wrong, before we knew who God was. We lived in ignorance. We fall prey to, fell prey to every evil desire. But now we don't have to do that anymore. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Right? So because this is kind of the end of the introduction of Peter's letter, he brought up this concept of living as exiles and foreigners, and now he's kind of bringing that up again to give some framing to what he has said. That through the Holy Spirit, uh, Peter has been given this inspiration to write these things. So because, because of our salvation, because of what Christ has done, we can choose to live holy lives, and we live our time here as foreigners. Not in fear of the world or what things can be done here or what people might do to you, but live in reverent fear of God because we're all in his hands anyway. For you know that it was not with perishable things like silver or gold that you were redeemed, that you haven't been bought back from death with things of this world. Instead, you were redeemed by Christ. You were redeemed from the empty way of life that's been handed down to you by your ancestors. You're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or deceit. Now, I've, I've preached on this passage before because I think it's such a powerful passage about how we are called to live lives of holiness. That because we have been saved by the one who is holy, that we ought to live holy lives. And when I was reading through it in preparation for this sermon, this idea that we have been redeemed from an empty way of life that has been handed down to us by our ancestors. It reminded me that my parents are just as broken as I am. And my grandparents and the people before them and the people before them, they were just as broken as I am now. They're just as broken as the world that my children were born into and will have to struggle with. That we're broken by sin, which brings shame and guilt. And all of us can feel hopeless when we realize that we're broken. All of us have to struggle with that hole in our hearts and in our lives. And this verse reminds us that that doesn't have to be our story. Your identity doesn't have to be your brokenness. Instead, realize that the hope that you can have is not hope in things of this world or the hope of the work of your hands. It's not hope for anything you can achieve. Instead, our hope is in the grace of God, the one who created us, who longs for us to be connected with him. That's what our hope is in. And the good news of Jesus, because that's what gospel means, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news is that we are not redeemed by perishable things like silver or gold. We're not redeemed by the American dollar or Bitcoin. We are redeemed by Christ alone. You cannot buy your way to salvation. You cannot earn your way to God. And for some people, that leaves them feeling hopeless. Until you realize that is nothing I could ever achieve on my own anyway. And the good news is that Jesus Christ has made that way for you. So when you choose to live for him, everything changes. Our salvation is bought and paid for by the blood of our Savior on the cross. Jesus died so that you can know the forgiveness and grace of our Father in heaven. In what things do you place your hope? Do you place it in the things of this world? 
You place it in yourself? Or is your hope in the grace of God? Because if my hope is in my marriage or in my children, if my hope is in the work of my own hands, if my hope is in my bank account, what kind of hope is there? Now, can I glorify God with what's in my bank account? Absolutely. Can I glorify God with my marriage, with my children, with my life? Absolutely. But my hope isn't in what I can do. My hope is in what God can do. And my joy is understanding what God can do through me. Now, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be simple. I'm, not, I'm never going to be the most popular person in the world. But like we learned with the kids this morning, when you walk with God and choose to do what's right, everything else might be washed away. But when you're loved by God and you love God, that's the only thing that lasts. It's the only thing that lasts. You see, the one who redeems us, the one who makes us holy because he is holy, well, Jesus, he was chosen before the creation of the world and has been revealed to us in these last times for our sake. Though you believe through him, you believe in God, the God who raised Jesus from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, well, love one another deeply and love from the heart. This reminds us of the lives that we ought to live because of what Christ has done. It reminds us of the lives that we ought to live because of who God is. Now this idea of holiness, living holy lives, what does that really mean? How are we to be living? We're to be living holy lives because God is a holy God. That's how we're to live. But what is holiness? What does that mean? And how do we do it? It's a big question that I'm going to attempt to answer very, very, very quickly. <laughs> it essentially means to be made holy. Holiness comes from the Old Testament and New Testament. It's all throughout Scripture. In Hebrew, which is the Old Testament it was written in, it is the word kadash. In the New Testament, written in Koine Greek, it is the word hagios. Those words mean set apart. That not only is God set apart from brokenness and evil and sin, that cannot touch him, that God then sets you apart and makes you holy. Nothing that you can do on your own. We live holy lives because our God is holy and we have been set apart. And a further understanding of that is that you have been set apart for a purpose. For a purpose. That your marriage has a purpose. Your children have a purpose. How you raise them and invest in them and guide them. The way that you conduct yourselves, even when no one else is looking, it has a purpose. And that purpose is to give glory to God. This congregation has a purpose in this community. One that's ordained by God. How are you participating in it? Your marriage has a purpose. And a marriage is two people working together, so it's not just one person trying to do it all. How are the two of you partnering together to live for the glory of God? Your family has a purpose. My friends, you, you have a purpose. Don't, don't ever think that the sins of your past mean that there is no hope for your future. Because let me tell you, what you have done cannot thwart the plans of God. Will you choose to partner with Him? To live into the holy life that He has called you to live and to see everything in your life changed and redeemed in ways you could never even dare to think or even imagine. Because you have purpose. And this church has purpose. May we live for Christ. If you'll pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to love and serve you. We pray, Lord, that as we participate in communion now, as we remember what Christ has done, that we wouldn't be so caught up in our own failures that we can't experience the overwhelming joy of salvation. Help us to truly ask for forgiveness and help us to live into the grace that we have been shown. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.